Um, Lewis wrote the first novel in the Space Trilogy as a result of a bet with J.K. with um, J.R.R. Tolkien. J.K. Rowling. <laughs> I do that all the time now. Um, and the bet was essentially to see which of them could finish a work first. It's entirely an unfair bet because Lewis could spit out books like crazy. And Tolkien's a perfectionist. He could never finish, really, almost anything. Um, and the bet was that Lewis would write a space travel novel and Tolkien would write a time travel. Obviously, where do we see that in Tolkien? We don't. Where? He didn't publish it. He never finished it. It's what is known as the Lost Road. It's in the 12 volume History of Middle Earth. Um, kind of gives you the, the framework for understanding Middle Earth and everything from a, our real world perspective. An Anglo Saxon mariner finds his way off to Amman and meets some people who knew what had happened and learns of the stories of Aragorn and Gandalf and Frodo and stuff. Okay. <laughs> through a series of kind of time travel stuff. So, and then Lewis wrote um, Out of the Silent Planet in like, I don't know, six or nine months. I mean, just sat down, just fired it off. So Out of the Silent Planet, we won't actually, um, only having a day to cover it won't be bad at all because, oh, most of the book I'm actually going to skip. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what happens when the character Ransom arrives on Malacandra, who he meets, why that's significant, etc. And then when he goes to meet Maladil in the final kind of interview with the godlike um, being there. <coughs> Paralandra doing it one day might be a little harder because it's also quite packed and it's really important because Paralandra is Lewis's retelling, essentially, of Paradise Lost set on a different planet, and where the Eve character doesn't fall. In other words, they become what they were meant to become at the um, end. And then that hideous strength is essentially Lewis's vision of the modern industrial scientific world devoid of really any sense of morality. It's kind of eerie when you come to think about it, because um, he's writing it in 1946, and it might as well be describing 2006, in certain terms of some of the um, language that he uses and such. Right? So that'll be due. I'll make a note to myself here. Uh, extra credit over image or abolition. So today we, we uh, finish mere Christianity come hell or high water. So I want to look at chapter 5, which is the end of the first book. Okay? Um, and then we're going to skip much of book 2, Christian behavior. Or what we might do is we might end, look at the end kind of, of book 4 and then kind of come back and hit some spots. Um, because what he does at the end of book 4 kind of Lead you right into abolition of man if you're interested in doing abolition of man. Okay, so the, pack, the practical conclusion, chapter 5 of book 2. Um, he starts off with the perfect conclusion, excuse me, the perfect surrender and humiliation were undergone by Christ. Perfect because he was God, surrender and humiliation because he was man. Now the Christian belief is that we somehow share the humility in Christian, excuse me, share the humility and suffering of Christ. We shall also share in his conquest of death and find a new life after we've died and in it become perfect and perfectly happy creatures. In that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, blah, 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 blah. Also, you know, new life will be found in Christ and such. So he goes on skipping the end of that paragraph and the next paragraph, pick up with the third. There are three things that spread the Christ life to us. Okay. Baptism, belief, and then he says that mysterious action, which people call by a variety of names. Communion, the Mass, uh, the Lord's Supper, 
the Eucharist, okay? It's that meal, if you want, okay? And so he's going to go on and talk about these, but he doesn't talk about them entirely from a doctrinal position. Notice what he says um, about halfway down in the next paragraph, okay? Uh, actually, about a third of the way down. He says, I've explained why I have to believe Jesus was and is God. It seems plain as a matter of history that he taught his followers that the new life was communicated in this way. In other words, I believe it on his authority. Don't be scared by the word authority. I know you've all seen the bumper sticker, you know, doubt authority or question authority. Believing things on authority only means believing them because you've been told them by someone you think trustworthy. Another way of describing it is just trust. Okay. So I believe there is such a place as New York. Now, when Lewis writes that, he's never been to New York. In fact, he never did go to New York. I've not seen it myself. I cannot prove by abstract reasoning that there must be such a place. I believe it because reliable people have told me so. And that makes perfectly good sense. So, every historical statement in the world is believed on authority. We believe that there was such a thing as the Civil War. <clears throat> Even though none of us has seen it. None of us has experienced it. It might be possible that you've talked to somebody who experienced it. Okay? If you're my age, you could have known somebody who was born in 1860 and lived... Uh, let's say 110 years old, and I could have met that individual when I was eight, okay, and then they die. I would have known then someone who experienced that in some sense, okay. So he goes on. None of us has seen the Norman Conquest or the defeat of the Armada, but we have read about it, right? We haven't seen films even of those or newsreels, but we've read accounts. So what are we doing? We are simply trusting what others have said. Now, you could become an arch skeptic <laughs> and say, like Othello says, if I don't see it with my own eyes, he tells Iago, give me the ocular proof. If I don't see it with my own eyes, I won't believe it. What does that mean you can't believe? Adams, when was the last time you saw one? <laughs> okay. Air? I don't know. I take, you can't go to LA. You'll believe in air. <laughs> Walk out your door and you'll see it. Believe me. Okay. Love? Can love be seen? Can it be tested? Can it be, be logically proven or verified? No. Can't. So if, if testing becomes your rationale, Okay. There's an awful lot, you know, as Hamlet says to Horatio, there's an awful lot in heaven of earth that are dreamt of in your philosophy. That is, that don't get included. All right? So he goes on. We believe them simply because people who did see them have left writings that tell us about them. In fact, on authority. So believing in the second, um, the Revolutionary War, according to the logic Lewis is using, is no more rational than believing in the person Christ. Why? Because you have people who describe the Revolutionary War, and you have people who describe Christ. The sources are essentially the same, eyewitness accounts. And you could go farther back, or you can go more recently. So, um, I don't want to pick up there. Go about... Two-thirds of the way down the next paragraph. He's talking about setting up baptism and belief and communion as things that um, will do instead of your own attempts to copy Christ. Meaning that you can do these external things rather than have some kind of internal change. A live body is not one that never gets hurt. Everybody in here has personal experience of that truth. But one that can, to some extent, repair itself. You know, you come across a uh, roadkill, and does the roadkill get up and walk away the next day? <laughs> no. 
It, does it re, you know, heal itself? No. In the same way, a Christian is not a man who never goes wrong, but a man who's in, able to repent and pick himself up and begin over again after each stumble. And this is a pretty important point, I think, that Lewis is trying to get across. Because there's this idea, and it was maybe even more prevalent in Lewis's day, that the Christian is the quote-unquote perfect person. Or the person who attempts to be perfect, and that therefore when the Christian falls or stumbles or sins or whatever, what do you do with the belief system that that person holds? You throw it out the window. Because what word do we use to describe someone who says one thing and then does the other? You call him a hypocrite. Okay? He attempts to get up again because the Christ's life is inside him, repairing him all the time, enabling him to repeat in some degree the kind of voluntary death which Christ himself carried out. Notice, not the kind of voluntary death, you know, nailed to a cross. What kind of voluntary death is he talking about? Uh, Self-abnegation. Yeah. The kind of death, the dying to one's desires, dying to one's wants. In other words, the gradual stopping of the error, so that maybe after 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, whatever, you stop doing the same thing over and over again. And you realize, no, that's not good. So, you know, out of a list of 100 cents, you stop one or two or three or whatever the case may be. That's why he says the Christian is in a different position from other people who are trying to be good. <coughs> they hope by being good to please God if there is one. Or, if there isn't, they hope to deserve approval from good men. The Christian thinks any good he does comes from the Christ life inside him. In other words, it's not from him. Okay, It's from Christ working in him. He does not think God will love us because we are good, but that God will make us good because he loves us. It's a beautiful little turn of phrases. Does not think God will love us because we are good. You know, um, one of the Gospels, I can never remember which one, the, uh, the guy comes up to Christ and says, Good Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And what's Christ's immediate reply? It isn't go and sell everything and help the poor and feed the hungry. Why did you call me good? The guy's like, I'm just trying to be nice, man. And chill out. Why did you call me good? There is none good but God. Now, a lot of people take that to be Christ's way of saying, very good. <laughs> you recognize me. You called me good master. There's none but good but God. Bingo, you got it right. I'm God. Okay? And by the way, I think is behind uh, Flannery Connors, a good man is hard to find. Okay? So, he, um, he'll make us good because he loves us. Just as the roof of a greenhouse does not attract the sun because it is bright, but becomes bright because the sun shines on it. Right? Um, so he talks more about Christ being in them and changing them, etc. Go to the end of that next paragraph, about, I don't know, four or five lines before the end. There is no good trying to be more spiritual than God. You know, my opinion, my, my fallen, sinful... <laughs> That, you know, probably 90, 95% of Christians ought to be made to, you know, memorize that little thing. Because so many people are trying to be super spiritual. You know, what's the phrase that you often hear? Warriors for Jesus or something like that. All right? God never meant man to be a purely spiritual creature. That's why he uses material things like bread and wine to put the new life into us. That's why when you go to some churches, for example, my church, you not only have bread and wine, you have incense so that your nose smells something. You have bells on censers as well as chanting so that you hear something. Certain times of the year, you do a lot of kneeling and prostrating, so your body is physically doing something. But what else is Lewis getting at? It appeals to the whole body. It's not 
just an intellectual exercise. It's not just thinking about God. Okay? So he goes on and said, but we might think this is crude and unspiritual. Because people tend to think, well, spiritual means, obviously, of the spirit. Well, it was an ancient Christian heresy, Gnosticism, that said the body is evil and bad. And that the whole goal was to release the soul from the body. It wasn't. Not in the early church. The early church said, no, the body is good. That's why Christ, you know, one of the reasons why at least, you have eyewitnesses to the resurrection and everything. And when Christ meets the disciples after he's resurrected, you know, he doesn't float off the ground. He doesn't, you know, say, watch this, guys. Go in and out of walls and stuff. What does he do at the garden, at the um, Sea of Galilee when they're out fishing the one time? Makes them food and eats it. <laughs> this is one of the nice things, I think, about the uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, the first one. What happens when um, Captain Barbosa tries to drink wine? It goes right through him. He can't taste food. Ghosts don't have a physicality. Okay? So, God does not. He invented eating. He likes matter. He invented it. Okay? So, everything that is, everything that has isness, what we would call matter, let's say. Matter is inherently Good. The Gnostics said matter is inherently evil and bad. So, you know, first day of creation, that's good. Second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, those are all good. All the things that are made, uh -huh. not really. He was, you know, he was being sarcastic when he said that. Okay? Not true. So, Lewis goes on. Here's another thing that used to puzzle me. Is it not frightfully unfair that this new life should be confined to people who have heard of Christ and been able to believe in him? And this is where certain groups of Christians would say, well, this is why it's important to go out and evangelize the world, to send people off to, you know, darkest Africa or the jungles of South America or New Guinea or the areas of South Pacific and stuff. Or because even if, next door. Or even next door. Because if they don't hear about Christ, what's the mentality? Damn to hell. Right? Lewis, truth is, God hasn't told us what his arrangements about the other people are. Whoa. What does that mean? Those to whom much is given, what? Much is expected. In other words, if you've been given information, for example, about the God-man, Christ, etc., then much is expected from you. But if you've not been given any information, does that mean nothing's expected? No. It means what St. Paul writes about in the book of Romans, that the law of God is written on their <coughs> words. And it doesn't mean that they have, you know, a la Socrates, you know, if you just sit down and start questioning them and everything, they'll mention, you know, Jesus and Mary and all the apostles. No. But what he means is they have some kind of inherent conscience that tells them, and we're back to the beginning of the book, what is right and what is wrong. So Lewis says, we do know that no man can be saved except through Christ. We do not know, we do not know that only those who know him can be saved through him. Yes. Could that also mean that it's not your job to save somebody? I don't know, Ken. Does it? That's how I read it. That it's not your job to say this is right for you. Oh, well, I mean, ultimately, using Lewis's logic, who does the quote unquote saving? Christ. Yeah, or God. It's never an individual down here. All that individual individual does is provide information. It's up to the person to respond to the information, etc. Look at that one sentence again. We do not know that only those who know him 
can be saved. Sorry. We do not know that only those who know him can be saved through him. What is he saying there? He's saying it is possible to be saved by Christ and yet to not know him. Okay. What is it? Um, Jesus says, I think it is uh, Matthew 25. It's the parable of the last judgment. He's going to divide, you know, to the right, to the left, the sheep and the goats. And he's going to say, you know, those of you fed me, clothed me, took care of me, visited me in prison, blah, 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 blah. You're going to go on to the right side. Those of you who didn't, you're going to go on to the left side. And these people are going to say, Lord, when did we? And he said, when you visited me in prison, when you visited me when I was hungry, but when did we? And as much as you've done it unto the least of these. Well, who are the least of these? People around you. You're driving down Broad Street, you go over or Main Street, you go over Broad Street, you, or take that back. You're going down Main Street, you go around the square, and there's usually at one of the two entrances on the west side of the square, a homeless guy sitting on the bench either on the uh, south side or the north side, bundled up with his sleeping bag and everything. It's kind of interesting today because I noticed him, and he was sitting there with either, either his iPod or his phone because he was you know, looking at it. Homeless guy. Almost like he had internet access, you know, was the, the strange thing, okay? Him, what he's saying is that's Christ, period, okay? But it's also, I think this gets to the answer or to the, the question of what Lewis is doing with that character of Emmet, E-M-E-T-H, at the end of um, Chronicles of Narnia. The servant of Tash. Put it in a modern context. The servant of Allah. Not the God of Christianity. Because keep in mind, that's Trinitarian. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Allah isn't Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's just Allah. And Allah is one. Period. I mean, they think of Christianity as being a pantheistic religion, essentially. Okay? Emmett finds himself in heaven. And he's like, what the hell am I doing here? I don't belong here. I never worshipped you. He talks to Aslan, the big hairy lion. And Aslan says, I took your worship to Tash is to me. You were merely misdirected. You were misguided. You didn't know any better. Okay? So, Christians are Christ's body. The organisms through which he works. Every addition to that body enables him to do more. You want to help those outside you? You must add your own little cell to the body of Christ, who alone can help them. Cutting off a man's fingers would be an odd way of getting him to do more work. In other words, cutting off the body of Christ, making it smaller, would be an awful hard way to make it larger. It doesn't make any sense. So, here's another objection people ask. Why is God landing in this enemy-occupied territory in disguise? and starting a sort of secret society to undermine the devil. Why doesn't he land in force? I mean, get on the internet and do all these crazy searches, you know, Jesus in the clouds and stuff. And you'll find all kinds of great Photoshop of Jesus coming in glory in the clouds and everything, angels and armies, etc. I mean, just kind of nut job stuff, in my opinion. Okay, Why doesn't he do that? Lewis says, well... We think he's going to, but we don't know when. We can guess why he's delaying, but even Christ deals with that. Because the apostles ask him, when? When's it going to happen? And what does he say? It's not for you to know. Period. Here's what your job is. Wait. Prepare. Lewis, he wants to give us the chance of joining his side freely. Because what happens if God suddenly appears right here in this room? Or Christ? We're all going to need clean pants. We're all going to need clean <laughs> pants. 
We're going to need to dust off our knees because we're probably going to fall on our faces. Because that would be the kind of experience that compels. It takes away choice, so to speak. Okay? And Lewis is saying, God doesn't want compulsion. God will invade. But I wonder whether people who ask God to interfere openly and directly in our world quite realize what it will be like when he does. When that happens, it's the end of the world. When the author walks onto the stage, the play is over. I love that line. I mean, can you imagine? You know, I'm teaching Shakespeare. Can you imagine? The, you know, Hamlet comes on. You know, they finish Hamlet. You got all these dead bodies on the stage. And then Shakespeare walks out. God is going to invade, all right. But what's the good of saying you are on his side? Then, then, when you see the whole natural universe melting away like a dream and something else comes crashing in. No. Lewis says, then it will be too late to choose your side. In other words, you got to choose now. Okay? No use in saying you choose to lie down when it has become impossible to stand up. Now, I will add, Lewis doesn't. There are a variety of fathers of the early church. I'm hoping to look at a couple of these in the spring of my course. There are a variety of fathers in the early church who say, no, it is possible to choose them or to choose after one's death. And this is even alluded to in the Old English poem Beowulf. Early in the poem, the narrator says that it will be well for the souls of those who choose after the death day to seek the God with embracing arms. That is, God has embracing arms. And the poet is saying, it'll be good for the person who, after they die, chooses that. Have you seen those people? I think you talked about it earlier, that they died and they've been just complete atheists. They haven't listened. To just nothing could turn them. And they've died and they've had this begging and they beg and they plead and they just, they come back and just, Absolutely. I don't know about that. I, just one second, Autumn. I read an a, a, um, article, when was this, about three weeks ago, of a, what was he? He's either a brain surgeon or a heart surgeon. But completely agnostic. Not atheist, agnostic. Um, I think he was a heart surgeon. So he knew how the heart worked the whole nine yards. And the guy essentially died. And was in a coma for six months, six weeks, I think it was. And then he comes out of the coma, and he's like, I'm not agnostic anymore. I don't know what happened. I don't know what it was I experienced. But I am now positive there is something after death. And he was one who, before, and apparently he had said this in public occasions, meetings, conferences, etc., that when you die... <clears throat> That's it. Nothing else. I think he was actually a cognitive scientist and said that. Okay, so, Autumn? The Mormon religion has where they do baptisms of the dead for the people that have died, died. and then accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so you have this person go in and they baptize you mm -hmm. over and over again for you have names read off and then they dump you. So. Mm -hmm. However, they have become so enthusiastic. They decided to start baptizing some Jews who were killed in concentration. Yeah, yeah Jews don't really, yeah, they're not really happy about that. It's um, a favor the descendants would really rather not have done for them. Um, okay, jump for a minute. If we can, we'll come back and, and do some of the intervening stuff. Jump to um, chapter 10. Okay. Of... Book four. Nice people or new men. Okay. And, and look how he starts this. He meant what he said. Those who put themselves in his hands will become perfect as he is perfect. Perfect in love, wisdom, joy, beauty, immortality. 
The change will not be complete in this life, for death is an important part of the treatment. Okay? How far the change will have, under, have gone before death in any particular Christian is uncertain. Now, I wanted, that's just kind of prologue to what I wanted to get to. And Lewis says, I think this is the right moment to consider a question which is often asked. If Christianity is true, why, not are, why are not all Christians obviously nicer than all non-Christians? Because let's admit it. You've probably all met at least one Christian who's an utter jackass. Who, because of that individual, you would probably rather not have, if you are a Christian, not have the name Christian associated. There's a whole with book you. about it. It's called Unchristian. Okay. So Lewis wants to know why this is. If conversion to Christianity makes no improvement in a man's outward actions, if he continues to be just as snobbish or spiteful or envious or ambitious as he was before, uh, notice. I think we must suspect that his conversion was largely imaginary. Notice all the hedging in that language. Because what does Lewis refuse to do? He refuses to judge. Okay. He says, you know, it appears, it looks. So he goes on. Fine feelings, new insights, greater interest in religion mean nothing unless they make our actual behavior better. Just as in an illness, feeling better is not much good if the thermometer shows that your temperature is still going up. I mean, you can be feeling better and have cancer, and your cancer can actually be getting worse. Okay? So it's not feelings. Christ told us to judge by results. And that's why, you know, in a, what is it, 1 Corinthians 15, you get the whole list of the fruits of the Spirit. Okay? Mercy, faith, charity, love, uh, self-control, um, you know, is actually the first one. And they build upon one another. So, when we Christians behave badly or fail to behave well, we are making Christianity unbelievable to the outside world. Well, what's Christ's final commandment to his followers? That you love one another. It doesn't end there. What's the final part? As I have loved you. So what does that mean, as I have loved you? Unconditionally. Keep going. What shows Christ's love? That does. When? After people love him back? No. When people don't love him. Okay, so let's use the whole token applicability thing and jump up to a modern example. What's he talking about? Well, don't think of the cross. There's a woman who her son was killed by another young man. And the young man went to jail, had no family, had no friends, had no nothing. And she went to jail. She now sees him now, and she's forgiven him for what he's done. And it's his, it's his family now. That's a pretty good example. <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty good example. What would another one be? How about rather than killing bin Laden, helping him? I don't mean helping him plan murders. I mean helping him. Serving him. Okay? That might be an extreme example. Think of somebody you know that you really don't like. Everybody knows someone like that. You know, an associate, a friend of sorts, or a friend of friends, or somebody in some group that you hang around. There's always somebody there that it just about makes your skin crawl to come into this person's presence. That you love one another as I have loved you. That means taking the worst person you can imagine and being willing to lay down your life for that individual. Being able to suffer 
on behalf of that individual, not because of that individual, on behalf of, to take whatever pain, whatever agony, whatever hardship, whatever sorrow that individual has, and take it upon yourself. Whoa, that's hard, okay? So, what's that mean? If we don't do that, Lewis says, then we make Christianity unbelievable. And that's the problem with the televangelists who go bad. The guys who, you know, uh, what's the one guy a couple of years ago, railed and railed and railed and railed against homosexuality, and it turns out had a homosexual love affair. Ted Hacker. Ted Hacker, okay. Or, you know, um, what's his name and Tammy Faye Baker, Jim Baker and Tammy Faye Baker from back in the late 80s, etc. Or Jimmy Swigger, or you know, almost pick your, okay, pick your preacher. So the wartime posters told us that careless talk costs lives. It's equally true that careless lives cost talk. That is, lives lived carelessly cause others to talk. Okay, skip the next paragraph and go on to the one with the. Uh, parentheses, talking about the several grounds. The world does not consist of 100% Christians and 100% non-Christians. Lewis says there are people who are slowly ceasing to be Christian, but still call themselves by that name, and some of them are clergymen, he says. Similarly, there are people in other religions who are being led by God's secret influence to concentrate on those parts of their religion which are in agreement with Christianity, right? And who thus belong to Christ, notice, without knowing it. Well, what does that mean? That means, for example, I would assume, those individuals who know nothing about Christianity, okay, or possibly know nothing about Christianity, and yet they go about their lives in such a way that they are demonstrating everything Christ talked about. They are living out everything Christ talked about. Why? Partly because of their religion, but partly also because of what Romans says about the law of God written on their hearts. This goes back to what he said earlier about, you know, there are elements of truth in all religions, right? Many of the good pagans, long before Christ's birth, may have been in this position. You know, my own personal belief. <laughs> I find it unimaginable to believe that Socrates, if I believe in a heaven and hell and such, that Socrates could be rotting in hell. If you read what Socrates reportedly said and reportedly taught, if there was ever a noble pagan or good pagan, someone who practiced the good way of living, helping others. It's Socrates, or Buddha. Buddha never heard a flea, literally probably, okay? Because it might be his great, 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 you know, grandfather reincarnated. Go down to the end of that paragraph. If you want to compare the bad Christian and the good atheist, you must think about two real specimens whom you have actually met. I'll give you an example of what I think, with maybe a few slight exceptions, was a good atheist, Christopher Hitchens. Okay. Everything I read about Christopher Hitchens' life was that if somebody needed something, he helped them. Whether they were an atheist like he was or not, unimportant. Okay. Douglas, Adams or Douglas, Adams. Douglas Adams. Okay. So, if Christianity, next paragraph, if Christianity is true, then it ought to follow A, that any Christian would be nicer than the same person would be if he were not a Christian. Or B, any man who becomes a Christian will be nicer than he was before. All right. Skipping a few sentences. Christian Miss Bates may have an unkinder tongue than unbelieving Dick Furkin. 
That by itself does not tell us whether Christianity works. Why? For the simple reason that everyone is screwed up. Some people to greater degree, some people to lesser degree. The question is what Miss Bates' tongue would be like if she were not a Christian. And what Dick's would be like if he became one. Now, I've known people who have kind of been both ways. People who had been unchristian and became Christian, and they quote-unquote cleaned up their act. But then I've also known people on the other side of the aisle who have been Christian per se, and then chucked it all and went the other direction. And when I say went the other direction, just really got mean, nasty, vile, rotten, you know, living only for themselves, as it were. Okay? Now we're going to skip. Uh, go to the paragraph numbered, the one after paragraph three, the one that begins, you cannot expect God, and go to the middle of the paragraph. Paragraph. He's talking about God and what God is anxious about or looking for. What he's watching and waiting and working for is something that is not easy even for God. Because from the nature of the case, even he cannot produce it by mere act of power. He is waiting and watching for it, both in Miss Bates and in Dick Furkin. Well, what is it he's waiting and watching for? Will they or will they not turn to him? And thus fulfill the only purpose for which they were created. Okay? The only purpose. Their free will is trembling inside them like the needle of a compass. But this is a needle that can choose. <laughs> The needle of compass can't say, eh, I think I'm going to go west. <laughs> it has to point magnetic north. But this is a needle that can choose. Will the needle swing round and settle and point to God? He can help it to do so, but he cannot force it. And this is the question you're going to see, if you've never read it before, until we have faces. So I think it's the most profound thing Lewis ever wrote. Because you have someone in till we have faces constantly asking, show me, you gods. If you are real, show me. Prove it to me. Make yourself known. All you do is speak to us in riddles, in hints, in shadows, in signs, in symbols. Never, the speaker says, clearly. Never out in the open. Okay? You want us to follow along, as it were, like Hansel and Gretel, following little crumbs, rather than having it nice and spelled out and clearly given. All right? So, skip the next paragraph. We'll go down to the middle of the, about a third of the way into the paragraph that begins, Do Not Misunderstand Me. Lewis says, It costs God nothing, so far as we know, to create nice things. But to convert rebellious wills cost his crucifixion. And even notice that. What happens, according to the biblical accounts, the Gospels, what happens at the crucifixion? What do the Jews who are crucifying Christ tell him to do? If you are the Son of God, come down off the cross. That's a pretty rational thing to ask. If you really are who you say, come down. Why doesn't he? Well, that would be cheating, wouldn't it? How would it be cheating? <clears throat> well, the deal is, is, that you, is that you were supposed to make this moral journey on your own, under your own power. If you have the assistance of witnessing something miraculous that you didn't really make the trip on your own. Others had witnesses or were witnesses of other miraculous powers, mm -hmm. which is why in the Gospels Christ says, you know, oh, you unbelieving generation, I've already shown you. You know, Lazarus gets raised from the dead. The widow of Nain's son gets raised from the dead. Jairus' daughter gets raised from the dead. You know, big 50-gallon drums of water get turned into wine and people get drunker and skunks on it, you know. People with leprosy are healed and everything. They see, they see, they see, they see, they see. 
And yet, what do they demand? More. I need more proof. And what does he finally say? He tells the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. And Lazarus, um, the rich man who dies, Lazarus was the poor guy sitting outside his gate, scabs and everything that the rich man never gave any food to. They both die. The rich man goes to hell. Lazarus goes to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man says, Father Abraham, send Lazarus down to give me some water. He goes, you know, no. You didn't give him anything in life. Suffer. Okay. And he says, okay, then at least send Lazarus back to the earth to tell my brothers that what's going to happen. He goes, they have Moses and the prophets. They wouldn't believe him. Because what, after all, are Moses and the prophets all talking about? The Son of God, etc. So, Lewis says, he can't compel. There's a paradox here, next paragraph. As long as Dick does not turn to God, he thinks his niceness, that is his behavior, is his own. And just as long as he thinks that, it's not his own. It is when Dick realizes that his niceness is not his own, but a gift from God, and when he offers it back to God, it is just then that it begins to be really his own. The only things we can keep are the things we freely give to God. <laughs> Classical paradox. <coughs> the only way we can be free is to be truly enslaved. John Donne's Batter My Heart, three-person God. Okay? Just look it up. Isn't this... Uh run afoul of the Calvinism here? Oh, yeah. Lewis isn't a pure Calvinist. He was raised a pure Calvinist. His father was an Ulster Protestant. I mean, really conservative um, Calvinist. But Lewis became an atheist, and I mean became a full bore Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens atheist. You know, you know, argue with Christians and everything until he suddenly found himself surrounded by them. And they were all his best friends. And all the literature he loved was written by Christians, etc. Okay? So he goes on. Next paragraph. There is even, when you come to think of it, or think it over, a reason why nasty people might be expected to turn to Christ in greater numbers than nice ones. He seemed to attract such awful people. And think about it. Who are the people who are hanging around with Christ? Whores? Tax collectors, drunks, cheats, riffraff. I mean, apparently the only quote-unquote good one was Luke, because he was a physician. I mean, what was Peter? He is a fisherman from Galilee. What is Galilee? Well, to a Jew, Galilee would be like Woodbury to a New York socialite. Yeah, some of your faces just tell me, hey, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uneducated. So, that is what people still object to in all his will. Do you not see why Christ said, blessed are the poor? How hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom? And no doubt he primarily meant the economically rich and economically poor. But do not his words also apply to another kind of riches and poverty? an emotional, a spiritual riches and poverty. If everything, if everything seems to come simply by signing checks, you may forget that you are at every moment totally dependent on God. And this is what happens <laughs> as one does move up the economic ladder. As things get easier and easier and easier, one begins to become more... At this forgetful of where things come from. And there's a beautiful passage in Beowulf. I always go back to Beowulf because I love Beowulf. There's a beautiful passage in Beowulf when Hrothgar is delivering what's called his homily or his sermon after Beowulf comes back after killing Grendel's mother and brings the sword. And Hrothgar talks about, you know, this, this young warrior who becomes a king has everything falls into place for him. And he says, and gradually this guy comes to believe he's on the top of the world and things will never change. And what that really means is he has God in his back pocket. 
He no longer needs God per se. When bad things happen, oh, well, that's when he can pull out his wallet and pull out the credit card with G-O-D on it to solve the problems. Okay? So that, you know, in that poem, when things get going really bad for Hrothgar, that's when he starts to pray. When things aren't going bad, when he's on top of the world, when he builds Herod and everybody's praising him, he's, you know, sitting there patting himself on the back, thinking I'm the greatest thing for the German people since, you know, Munster cheese or whatever. And then Grindel comes. Why? Has to take him down a few notches. So, now quite plainly, natural gifts carry with them a similar danger. If you have sound nerves and intelligence and health and popularity and a good upbringing, you are likely to be quite satisfied with your character as it is. In other words, if you're one of those fortunate few who has good looks, has good brains, has good skills, so that nothing is hard for you, what do you tend to think? Oh, hmm, I've got it made. This is just how I am. Often people who have all these natural kinds of gifts, skipping a few lines, cannot, natural kinds of goodness, cannot be brought to recognize their need for Christ at all until one day the natural goodness lets them <coughs> down and their self-satisfaction is shattered. What does that mean? Maybe one day they're proven or shown to be not as smart as they thought they were. Not as gifted as they thought they were. Or they come up to conflict with somebody else who has more brains, better looks, better abilities. And they lose. <laughs> they take second place rather than first place. Have you ever known somebody who's seemingly skated by all through life, has had what appears to be a perfect life, no problems, and then they hit their head up against an obstacle? If you have, what has happened to that individual when they hit that obstacle? No idea what to do. It's like, ah, you know, my whole world has just fallen apart because they've never had to do something. Lewis, in other words, it is hard for those who are rich in this sense to enter the kingdom. Because what's one of the meanings of the word rich? Full, wide, expansive. And Christ says it's easier for a rich man to what? Pass through the eye of a needle than to enter the kingdom of God. Well, what do you have to do to pass through the eye of a needle? you got to shrink down and get really small. So if the riches Lewis is talking about here are inherent abilities and skills, what does that mean? How do you shrink down your inherent abilities and skills? Does that mean if you're a fantastic musician, say a guitar player, you cut your fingers off so you can no longer play guitar? No, that's ridiculous. It means it, how, it is how you think about yourself. And I don't mean you suddenly go, oh, I'm the world's most horrible, you know, guitar player. No. It means addressing oneself, one's skills, abilities, riches, with a sense of humility. It's not me that's playing. It's not my ability. It's a gift, a talent. So, it's very different for the nasty people. The little, low, timid, warped, and blooded. You kind of get the impression Lewis maybe has some pictures in his mind of who he's thinking about. I do at least. Lonely people or the passionate, sensual, unbalanced people. If they make any attempt at goodness at all, they learn <laughs> in double quick time that they need help. Why do they learn that they need help? Because in their attempt, they fail. They fall. It is Christ or nothing for them. It's taking up the cross and following or despair. They're the lost sheep. He came to find them. They are the poor. He blessed them. Okay? So, 
If, uh, excuse me, there is either a warning or encouragement for every one of us, Lewis says. If you're a nice person, if virtue comes easily to you, beware. If virtue comes easily to you, if you're not tempted by too much food, too much drink, too much sex, too much, too much, period, beware. Why? Because you will be. You know, it's like when Yoda tells Luke, when Luke says, I'm not afraid of Darth Vader. You will be. Yes. Okay. The devil was an archangel once. His natural gifts were as far above yours as yours are above those of a chimpanzee. It's actually not a proper analogy. It should be as yours are above those of a paramecium. <laughs> okay, keep, the devil was an archangel. He wasn't just an archangel. He was highest angels of the archangels, higher than the cherubim and the seraphim, son of light. Or son of the morning star. Christ is the morning star. Okay? He was the highest of the created order. And look what happened. Whew. Screw tape. <laughs> if you are a poor creature, poisoned by a wretched upbringing in some house full of vulgar jealousies and senseless quarrels, saddened with some loathsome sexual perversion, nagged day in and out by an inferiority complex that makes you snap at your best friends, don't despair. And I, you know, I read that and I think Lewis is talking about himself. Don't despair. He knows all about it. You are one of the poor whom he blessed. He knows what a wretched machine you're trying to drive. What's the wretched machine? The body. Keep on. Notice, do what you can. There's a fantastic film. It's in Russian. Well, it's, it's fantastic if you're of a certain mindset. And in Russian, it's called Ostrov. The English translation is the island. And it's about a, a guy who's in the Navy in Second World War in Russia. He's a Russian sailor who's on a coal ship, and the ship blows up, etc., and he gets rescued by these monks, and so he, he awakens at this monastery, and he stays at this monastery, off, like off in Siberia, okay? <clears throat> and it's all about him as a monk. His name is Father Anatoly, okay? The guy who plays him, by the way, the actor who plays him, was, or is, was, I guess, this huge, like, like the... Um, Mick Jagger of Russian rock. I mean, huge rock star. Okay? After he shot this film, he actually became a monk. I mean, completely left it all behind. And anyways, there's this scene when he's getting ready to die because he knows when he's going to die. I mean, he knows, and, and this happens in Christian history. There are people who are generally called saints, that know when the hour of their death will be. And so he knows when he's got to die, and he asks one of the other guys, build me a casket and all this kind of stuff. And he lays down in his coffin to die. And he tells this other monk who he's had this horrible relationship with. I mean, they've been at it hammer and tongs all this time. Because Father Anatoly, he's what's called in the church a fool for Christ. He does all this weird, crazy stuff, okay? Yet he's able to cast out demons and able to see into people's souls and know what's really troubling them and everything. Well, he lays down in his coffin, and this other priest is with him, and he asks, you know, what's your final word, Father? This is something that happens in the Orthodox Church, you know, somebody getting ready to die, and they give their final word, as it were. And Father Anatoly says, try not to sin too much. Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, don't sin. Why not? Exactly. To say don't sin to somebody is to set a bar so high, no one can get over it. So don't sin too much. I know you're going to sin. 
Just try to curb that appetite a little bit. <coughs> That's what Lewis means there. Do what you can. One day you will fling it on the scrap heap, that is, it, your body, and give you a new one. So, next paragraph, last sentence or so. A world of nice people, content their own, in their own niceness, looking no further, turned away from God, would be just as desperately in need of salvation as a miserable world, and might be even more difficult to save. Now, there is a work of modern literature that describes that world. Brave New, Brave new World, perfect. Okay, It's nice people. They get all of their needs and desires, etc. met, and yet, how much in need of salvation is Brave New World? Well, John Smith teaches them a few things. He says, even with all your stuff, he wants a world of pain. He wants sorrow. He wants sadness. He wants ugliness. Why? Because without something to strive for, what do you become? Nothing. Static. Okay. God became man to turn creatures into sons. Now, there's early church father, St. Athanasius, who said, but God became man so that man might become God. I don't mean God in, a, in the Mormon church sense. I mean God in the sense that, what is it? It's either first or second Peter. Peter writes and says, Know you not that ye are partakers of God? Partakers of God. Well, what does he mean by that? One thing he means is what happens in that Eucharist, that communion, supper of Christ, whatever you want to call it. Well, even in a non-liturgical church, a Protestant church, you still, you know, you think of that as this is a commemoration. This is a remembrance. Okay? But what does Christ say? When you do this, you eat of my flesh, you drink of my blood. Well, who and what is Christ? God. The old English poem, The Dream of the Rude, repeatedly emphasizes this because it talks about Christ hanging on the cross, totally nude, totally naked. And in the very next aphoristic phrase, it says, He who was God lies dead, the Lord of hosts. <laughs> well, how can the Lord of hosts, God, be dead? Well, in his human shape, he can. Okay? So, God became man to turn creatures into sons, not simply to produce better men of the old kind, but to produce a new kind of man. Okay? And then Lewis says, in the next paragraph, uh, about halfway in, right in the middle, of it, what can you ever really know of other people's souls? What can you know of what somebody is undergoing, what they're suffering, of their temptations, their opportunities, their struggles? One soul in the whole creation you do know, and it's the only one whose faith is placed in your So, never ask for whom the bell tolls, John Donne writes. It tolls for thee. Never assume somebody else's soul is going to hell. Think about your own. Okay? Then we get the new men. And he talks about, in the opening paragraph, in the last chapter, I compared Christ's work of making new men to the process of turning a horse into a winged creature. A simple old horse, if you're familiar with Chronicles of Narnia, strawberry into fledge. Okay? A horse into uh, Pegasus. Okay? I use that extreme example in order to emphasize the point that it's not mere improvement, but transformation. That's the goal. The nearest parallel to it in the world of nature is to be found in the remarkable transformations like, you know, the stupid little worm or caterpillar becomes the beautiful butterfly, etc. 
until the cat kills it or something. So, go on to um, one, two, the third paragraph. Okay. Talking about when these kinds of changes will occur. The Christian view is precisely that the next step has already appeared. It's really new. It's not a change from brainy men to brainier men. It is a change that goes off in a totally different direction. A change from being creatures of God to being sons of God. Creatures of God, pots and pans, to sons, children of God. And he talks about, you know, what happened in Palestine 2,000 years ago, etc. And then go on to the paragraph with the parentheses two in front of it. At the earlier stages, living organisms have had either no choice or very little choice about taking the new step. Progress was, in the main, something that happened to them. And he's talking about evolution. Okay? But in the new step, the step from being creatures to being sons is voluntary. Well, at least voluntary in one sense, he says. It's voluntary in the sense that when it is offered to us, we can refuse it. See, back in evolutionary history, if you accept evolution, don't want to step on anybody's toes or don't. If you accept evolution, you know, when the first ape, simian, whatever you want to call it, dropped out of the tree and stood up on its legs and said, whoa, I'm taller, I look better, I can run faster, etc. Okay. That wasn't a choice. That was just something it did. But now, we have a choice. Lewis says, next paragraph, I have called Christ the first instance of the new man. But of course, he's something much more than that. He's not merely a new man, but the new man. The origin and center and life of all the new men. He came into the created universe of his own will, bringing with him the Zoe, the new life. Okay? So he goes on and then talks about how the speed of this progress um, takes place over time. And go on to the paragraph that begins, on this view, the thing has happened. And go to the end of that paragraph. Okay. He says... Um, yeah, just the last couple of sentences. In that way, to become holy is rather like joining a secret society. To put it at the very lowest, it must be great fun. But you must not imagine that the new men are, in the ordinary sense, all alike. A good deal of what I've been trying to say, or saying in this last book, might make you suppose that it was bound to be so. To become new men means losing what we now call ourselves. Out of ourselves, into Christ we must go. So he says, I need an illustration. But it's difficult to find one. Why? Because, of course, no two things are related to each other, just as the creator, creator is related to one of his creatures. And this, is, this gets at a central aspect in the way Lewis argues. There's a, a lecture, or a essay, I'm trying to remember what it's called. Transposition. Transposition. I think it's in God in the Dock. Where he talks about arguing from the lower to the higher. In other words, we can't see God. But we can see fathers all around us. And so we can get an image of God the Father by looking at <clears throat> earthly fathers. We can get an image of God, this is Tolkienian, God the Creator by looking at creators around us. Okay? God the Musician by looking at musicians around us. Just be careful about which ones you look at. You don't want to go off, you know, Ozzy Osbourne and think, oh God, you know. <laughs> Be kind of scary. Okay? Um, last two paragraphs. Okay, he's still trying to come up with an illustration. And so he says, um, it's something like that with Christ and us. The more we get what we now call ourselves out of the way and let him take us over, the more truly ourselves we become. Well, what does he mean by ourselves? Our focus on self. Push that out. Let him come in 
And what is Lewis saying? Then we discover truly what we are. There's so much of him that millions and millions of little Christ, all different, will still be too few. In that sense, our real selves are all waiting for us in him. It's no good trying to be myself without him. Why? Because there is no real self without him. Why? A self, any self, is not self-existing. It doesn't exist on its own. It only exists in that the I am first exists. Okay? So it's only in discovering this, that this can really exist. Lewis goes on. In fact, what I so proudly call myself becomes merely the meeting place for trains of events which I never started and which I cannot stop. In other words, things that happened long before I came into the picture, what I call my wishes become merely the desires thrown up by my physical organism, my body, or pumped into me by other men's thoughts, advertising, or even suggested to me by devils. Eggs and alcohol and a good night's sleep. I don't know, personally, I wouldn't mix eggs and alcohol, but, you know, to each his <laughs> own. And a good night's sleep will be the real origins, cigars and alcohol, yes, of what I flatter myself by regarding as my own personal, my own highly personal and discriminating decision to make love to the girl opposite to me in the railway carriage. Notice he never even, you know, assumes that there's any relationship between himself and the girl opposite me in the railway carriage. Propaganda will be the real origin of what I regard as my own personal political ideas. I'm not in my natural state nearly so much of a person as I like to believe. Yeah, and I'll give you a personal anecdote. I think of what he's talking about. I was watching TV. I don't know if it was last night. Yeah, it was last night. Um, my wife and I had a meeting to go to. And we came home. And our kids had recorded The Voice. we kind of gotten into watching The Voice. And I'm sitting there watching The Voice and people cheering and all that kind of stuff. And I sat there and I said to my wife and the kids that were in the room, I said, whoa. What? I said, I just had a feeling of Hunger Games. Like, this was part, the only difference is there are people being slaughtered. I think that's an important one. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Pretty important detail, then. <laughs> Dreams are slaughtered. <laughs> okay. But, but, I mean, think about that for a minute. In those quote-unquote reality shows like that, how real are they really? I mean, my daughter's sitting there going, I just want to hug him, talking about Blake Shelton. I just want to, it's like, hello, reality, not going to happen. You know, Miranda Lambert standing there with a buck knife. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> okay. So, he says, propaganda will be the real origin of what I regard as my own personal political taste. How many of us think, and I'm talking to myself here, how many of us think that our own political our ideas are our own and they haven't been fed to us by whatever source, okay? Whether parents, family, the, you know, the one-eyed monster that sits in most people's rooms, etc., computers. I am not in my natural state nearly so much of a person as I like to believe. And there's a beautiful passage in one of the books by the author that Lewis, Lewis said that he fancied he never wrote a book that he did not quote from, okay, George MacDonald. And I think it's Fantasties, fantastic book, where this character, I'm, probably, I'm almost positive it's Fantasties, where the character Anodos He's trying to get back to his world, as it were. And he comes across this old couple, really old. 
And they're snarking and sniping at each other, and they're skeletons, because they're dead. Okay? But they're not entirely skeletons. They have a little bit of flesh on them. And here's what McDonald does with these characters. These are people who are becoming. That is, they look to be dead, but they're not really, or they are really, but they're in the process of finally becoming real people. Because what they were before was just kind of um, conglomerations of flesh, let's say. In other words, they didn't have real selves. They had identities that were created through what they sucked in from around them. They did not know their true selves. They did not, as Lewis will suggest, in till we have faces. They did not yet have faces. They didn't have a consciousness that could perceive God. Okay? So, at the beginning I said there were personalities in God. I'll go further now. There are no real personalities anywhere else. Sameness is to be found most among the most natural men, not among those who surrender to Christ. Okay? But he goes on. There must be a real giving up of the self. You must throw it away blindly. Christ will indeed give you a real personality, but you must not go to him for the sake of that. That is, he's saying you don't become a Christian because you want something in return. You don't become a Christian because you don't want to burn in hell. Okay? As long as your own personality is what you're bothering about, you are not going to him at all. The very first step is to try to forget about the self altogether. Your real, your new self, will not come as long as you're looking for it. That's why Christ says, you want to find yourself? Lose yourself. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Well, what does take up your cross and follow me mean? It doesn't mean like the Filipinos mean every Easter. You know, go build a cross and have somebody nail you to it so that you can reenact the crucifixion. It's not what it means. What is your cross? It's the thing you don't want to do every day or every moment of every day that you ought to do. Hate to say it, but right now it's focusing here rather than elsewhere. <laughs> and when you're in another class, it's focusing on that class. And when you're with your wife, your daughter, your husband, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, whatever, it's putting all your focus and attention on them rather than on you. What are you going to get out of this relationship? It's not it. No. The same principle holds for more everyday matters. Even in social life, you'll never make a good impression on other people. What? Until you stop thinking about the impression you're making. What's the you know prime way to kiss a job goodbye in an interview? Say you're not qualified. Yeah, I mean, if they ask, well, well, which one are your faults? Well, I don't really think I'm qualified. Okay, you can leave now then. <laughs> if you don't think you're qualified, well, okay, what else? To be so nervous about how you appear that you don't appear. That you put on some, you know, act. Because what's going to happen? If you put on an act and then you get the job, you will not keep that job. I had a, a job interview once, and this was a, it was actually for a small Christian school. I knew some stuff about the school. I interviewed at, at MLA, Modern Language Association, this was in Chicago, I think it was. And the first question out of one of the interviewers' mouth was about the person I wrote, wrote my dissertation on, John Dunn. And the question was, well, don't you think Dunn is rather chauvinist? And when she asked that question, I thought, okay, I don't want to teach her. And I said... I just, you know, gave her both barrels. I said, no, frankly, I don't. I don't. I think John Dunn is about as far from a chauvinist as you can get. And frankly, I really think asking that kind of question is more sexist than anything John Dunn. And I just, you know, kind of went on. I mean, she was like deer in the head, like stunned that anybody would say this in a job interview. Okay? That would have been interesting. Because I knew if I took this job, I would not, 
I would not be a good fit. Yeah, it just would not happen. Okay? So, he goes on. Even in literature and art, no man who bothers about originality will ever be original. Whereas if you simply try to tell the truth, you will nine times out of ten become original without ever having noticed it. Look at most fantasy literature today. It's crap. For the simple reason, they try to be Tolkien rather than being themselves. There's only one Tolkien. Only he could be Tolkien. Peter Jackson is not Tolkien. He can never come close. Right? There's only one C.S. Lewis. A lot of other people have tried to be allegorical, and yet it comes over like a sledgehammer, the religiosity. Lewis does too sometimes. So he says, give up yourself, and you will find your real self. Lose your life, you will save it. Submit to death. Death of what? Your ambitions and favorite wishes every day, and death of your whole body in the end. Submit with every fiber of your being, and you will find eternal life. Keep back nothing. Why? Because the soul that keeps back nothing is try, always trying to say, mine, <laughs> my precious, as it were. Okay? Keep back nothing. Nothing that you have not given away will be really yours. Now, this is all great and high-minded and, and all that kind of stuff, right? Well, look what happens when his wife dies. Woo! Give back everything you have. Accept it all as a gift. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Not her. <laughs> you could take every... Not her. So that when God brings Joy David Man into his life and then takes her away again a short four years later, Lewis is pissed. I mean, seriously put out of joint. And he has to wrestle with that. Okay? All right. We'll stop there. We'll pick up with... We'll do, not pick up with out of the silent planet on whatever day that is. Thursday. If you haven't remembered to, vote. You have a few more hours.